As promised, I have a magnetic field superposition problem for you. I have an arrangement of three wires shown below, a circular loop of wire carrying a clockwise current of 3.5 milliamps, a straight piece of wire carrying a current up into the left of 2.9 milliamps, that wire is angled at 60 degrees above the horizontal, and a wire carrying 4.2 milliamps of current directly out of the board. The first step I like to do for any superposition problem is to find the directions of any of our vectors. The steps overall will be the same as other superposition problems, but we'll have different equations to determine our magnitudes and different rules to determine our directions. For magnetic fields, we'll use our first right-hand rule, the one that relates the direction of current to the direction of the magnetic field. Starting with wire 1, wire 1 will create magnetic field B1, and if we run our right thumb in the direction of the current in I1, and curl our fingers around the wire, we can see that the magnetic field will come out of the page on the down left side of the wire and into the page on the up right side of the wire. Since our point of interest, the center of the circle, is on the left side of this wire, B1 will be out of the page. B2, on the other hand, is running directly out of the page so if we put our thumb directly out of the page, we can see that the magnetic field will make counterclockwise circles around the wire 2. Oops, that's not what I want. So to make this a little clearer to see exactly which way it goes, we can draw a line straight from the wire causing the magnetic field to the point where we are measuring the magnetic field and our magnetic field has to be perpendicular to this green line we just drew. So our magnetic field will lie along this line, and if we want our magnetic field to make counterclockwise circles around our wire 2, our magnetic field must point this direction, up and to the left. And I will label that here, and I will label that under my directions as well. So up and to the left will be sufficient for now, we will eventually need an angle, but we will get there. Last but not least, we have the magnetic field caused by the loop itself. And the magnetic field inside the loop, if we follow our right hand rule with our thumb moving clockwise around the circle, our fingers will point into the page in the center of the loop, and that is the direction of our magnetic field. With our direction squared away, we can begin to work on finding the magnitudes of each of these vectors. We will be working with two formulas today, one of which is the magnetic field created by a long straight wire, B wire, is the permeability of free space times the current in question divided by 2 pi r where r is the distance from the object causing the magnetic field to the point where we are measuring the magnetic field. And we will also want the magnetic field created by a circular loop of wire, which is, again, mu naught times the current in question divided by 2 times capital R, which is the radius of our loop. From here, we can start to look at each wire individually. Using our formula, B1 is caused by a long straight wire, so we will want mu naught i divided by 2 pi r. Since we want the magnetic field caused by wire 1, we want current 1 and r1. A quick unit conversion here, i1 is 2.9 milliamps and we want to convert that into amps to stick to SI units. So put milliamps on the bottom to cancel out the units we don't want and replace it with amps on the top. And there are 1000 milliamps in one amp, which gives us 0 0.0029 amps. R1 will likewise require a conversion 
to label the distance for us. It is the distance from the wire causing the magnetic field to the point where we are measuring the magnetic field. So this distance here in green is R1. Hopefully you can see that R1 is 20 centimeters. And just to convert that into SI units, I'll show you guys the conversions the first time around and then I'll leave them off after that because they're pretty straightforward conversions. We want to cancel out centimeters and replace it with meters. And there are 100 centimeters and one meter, which gives us a distance of 0.2 meters. Coming back to our formula, we can now start to plug in some numbers. Mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7th tesla meter per amp. Our current is 0 0.0029 amps. Divided by 2 times pi times our 0.2 meters. This gives us a value for V1 of 2.9 times 10 to the negative ninth Tesla, the SI unit for magnetic field, which actually 10 to the negative nine is one of the metric prefixes we can know. And I'm just going to, in order to save space, Right, this is 2.9 nanotesla. So we now have the first of our three magnitudes that we will need. I'm going to do the other long straight wire next, B2, which will be mu naught times I2 divided by 2 pi R2. My bad, not R squared, R subscript 2. So we've actually already labeled our distance R2 in our diagram. The distance from the wire causing the field to the point where we are measuring the field gives us our distance R2. R2 may be a little less obvious to see how we find the actual distance, but as always in physics problems, look for triangles, especially right triangles. And here is one particular right triangle that can help us. This triangle is on the bottom side, equal to the radius of the circle, 15 centimeters. And on the vertical side of this triangle, the labeled distance 10 centimeters plus another 15 centimeters gives us 25 centimeters. So again, a little bit off to the side. R2 will be the square root of 15 centimeters, whole thing squared, plus 25 centimeters, the whole thing squared, and all of that under the square root, which gives us a value for R2 of 29.2 centimeters, or 0.292 meters. The current will also need to be converted into amps, but this is a straightforward enough conversion that I will just do it in my head. So we have four pi times 10 to the negative seventh Tesla meter per amp for our mu naught, times our converted current of 0 0.0042 amps, divided by two times pi, times our R value we just found of 0.292 meters. That gives us a value for B2 of 2.88 times 10 to the negative ninth Tesla or 2.88 nanotesla. Last but not least, we have the magnetic field caused by the loop, the circular loop of wire itself. And B loop has the formula mu naught i, and we will want the current of the loop, divided by 2 times capital R, the radius of the loop. Plugging in some values and again doing some conversions, 
we have mu naught, 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7th tesla meter per amp, times the current of 3.5 milliamps, or 0 0.0035 amps, divided by 2, no pi here, just times the radius, which is 15 centimeters, or 0.15 meters. That leaves us a value of the magnetic field for the loop as 1.471 times 10 to the negative 8th Tesla, which, after a quick unit conversion, we can write as 14.71 nanotesla. Not completely formal scientific notation, but I wanted to keep all of our magnetic fields with the same metric prefix. So, with all of this squared away, we can now start to construct our table to add up all of these magnetic fields. Let's see, where will I have the most room? About here. So, we'll have our X components, our Y components, and now our Z components as well to add up. And we will be adding up B1, B2, and B loop, which together will give us our total magnetic field. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of these rows will be easy to fill in. Well, first of all, we're going to need a coordinate system. Shame on me. So, I will pick X positive to the right, Y positive upward, and a positive direction for Z, I will choose out of the board. But these are entirely arbitrary. B1 is pretty straightforward because B1 points out of the board, which means our X and Y components are zero. The entire magnitude of 2.9 Tesla, sorry, nano Tesla, points out of the board, which is the positive Z direction. Similarly, the magnetic field of the loop points into the board, so we will again have zero for our X and Y components, and the entire magnitude of 14.71 nanotesla goes into the Z direction, this time in the negative Z direction, because B loop points into the board, and our coordinate system specifies Z to be positive out of the board. Our last vector, we can say for sure has zero Z component. B2 does not point into or out of the board at all, just points up and left in the negative X and positive Y directions. But we're going to need an angle here. Again, always helpful to look for triangles and Here's a right triangle right there. So if we could find this angle theta, then we would be able to solve for our x and y components of B2. In order to find that angle, we're going to need to know a couple other things. One of them is that the magnetic field and the line that represents the distance r are always perpendicular to each other, or 90 degrees apart. So, if we look carefully, we see we have a straight line right here. Angles that add up to a straight line have to give you 180 degrees. So if I were to label this angle phi right here in my green triangle that I used to find R2, we can say that phi plus 90 degrees plus theta must give us 180. Doing a little bit of solving, our angle theta will be 90 degrees minus phi in the green triangle. We know the opposite and adjacent components to angle phi, so a quick inverse tangent of opposite 15 centimeters divided by adjacent 25 centimeters gives us an angle for phi of 31.0 degrees. 
The units don't really matter here in the numerator and denominator because they cancel. As long as they're the same, everything will work out. Then, that gives us the angle theta that we want of 59.0 degrees. Put the work up here for the components of B. But B2x will be the magnitude of B2 and the x component up here is the opposite component, so we want the sine of theta, and the x component of b2 points left, which is the negative x direction. b2y will also be the magnitude of b2, but this time times the cosine of theta, because b2y is the adjacent component to that angle theta. B2 y points upward, so this will be in the positive y direction. Plugging those numbers into our calculator for x, we end up with negative 2.47 nanotesla and positive 1.48 nanotesla for the y direction. With all of the rows of our table completed, now we need to total up each column to get the x, y, and z components of the total magnetic field. A couple of our columns are pretty easy. They only contain one non-zero element. And it's straightforward enough to subtract two numbers in our calculator to get 11.81 nanotesla in the negative z direction for our final component. Now we have our three components for our total magnetic field, and we can use a modified form of our Pythagorean theorem, where we take the x component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared as well. Technically, this is always true. We just haven't had any z components so far, so we've left it off. I'm going to leave everything in nanotesla because if I plug them all in in nanotesla, I will get a value out in nanotesla, save myself having to convert the value twice. Be sure to put parentheses around any negative component values before you square them, or order of operations may leave you with an extra negative sign that you do not want. Or, because we're squaring these numbers anyway, just leave off any positives or negatives altogether. with each of our components squared and added to each other, we're now ready to plug into our calculator to obtain a total magnetic field of 12.16 nanotesla, which in tesla would be 1.216 times 10 to the negative eighth tesla. And this is our final answer. On some questions you might also be asked to determine the direction of the total magnetic field. If I'm going to ask you to find the direction of the total magnetic field, I will give you a problem that has zero for its z component. There are ways to describe direction in three dimensions, but we aren't going to get into them in this class, so this will be as far as you'll be expected to go on the test. That's it, and I will see you all in class for the test on Monday. Have a good day.